Mark, you mind switching that over? I made the comment last week when we introduced singing night. One of the hardest things to do at the beginning of a, a, a new section is to break the old habits. To quit saying, turn to Ephesians, anything, and to start saying, turn to something else, is really difficult. But I practiced for the last several days so that when I got up before you tonight, I would be fully equipped to say, open your Bibles to Colossians. I'm, I'm, I'm joking. Colossians chapter 1, we're going we're gonna to work through some of this. Um, tonight, we'll get down through verse 8 of chapter 1. I'll, I'll make a few comments about the handout, which is still out there on the foyer, um, but I'll make some of those comments after we start with a word of prayer. So let's, let's begin there, shall we? Father, we thank you for the blessings that you give to us. We thank you for our time of study tonight. We're excited to jump into another portion of your book the book of Colossians. Help us to glean from it the things most appropriate and most necessary that we can better serve you. We can be uh, a church that reflects you, that that reflects your will in this world, that we can be individuals that are committed fully and completely to the cause of Christ, that we can glorify and exalt your holy name in a world that so desperately needs to know the truth because the truth illuminates and the world is in darkness. Father, help us to be faithful to you and faithful to the text tonight. Be with those in the classes in the back as well, students and teachers alike, that we can all be brought closer to you and your holy will. Please be with our shepherds. Please be with our evangelistic efforts. And may you be glorified in all things tonight and in the days to come. We ask this in Christ's name. Amen. All right. So let's, let's discuss just a couple things real quick by way of introduction. On the handout, you'll notice this thing follows almost the exact same layout that Ephesians followed. So they're not going to, if you were in Ephesians class, nothing really going to stand out here as new. There is a schedule. You guys know this. I stick to this schedule. I want to cover all of the material. I do not like, and maybe it is my compulsive issues. Um, we could talk about that in another lesson. But I, I do not like to leave off really, really good material. I don't want to get all the way through Philippians chapter 2 and a half and leave off Philippians 3 and 4. So we we will skip over a couple of things if we need to. We will shut down some comments if we need to. I'm going to keep us on schedule. I believe that's one of my main jobs in here is to keep this, to glorify God, better understand the text, and make sure we're covering the text. So we're going to follow this schedule. You'll notice a couple of guys on here to teach. And uh, apparently I grabbed an older handout with nobody's name on it. So anyways, be aware of that, you men that teach. Uh, be aware of that. You're teaching. You'll get, you'll get us caught up. See, I'm going to drag us behind for a couple of classes and then give Larry a chapter and a half to teach in one class. You're welcome, Larry. All right. On the second page, Colossians chapter 1, there's less questions this class because there's less things I want to ask you this class. We're, we're div- div- uh, dividing this up, introduction and the first eight verses, so... I'm going to kind of run through some of the introduction stuff. Left you a little box there where you can jot some notes. Um, Do not be afraid to ask questions, but not all questions need to be asked publicly. Okay? Good questions. Love good questions. Uh, And if you have good questions, you feel free to ask them, but sometimes good questions are are asked better in, in private and not in public. So... Be ready to ask questions, be ready to discuss the text. You guys that were in Ephesians last quarter, again, we're going to follow the same general plan. We're going to cover the questions on the handout, we're going to cover the text in detail, Uh, we're going to draw some applications, we're going to draw some applications tonight, and then if we have time, I'll leave some room for you to make some applications as well that stand out to you. Sound good? If it doesn't, you're in the wrong class. Um, So, anyways, that's what we're going to do. Colossians chapter 1, verse 1. Paul, an apostle of Jesus Christ by the will of God, and Timothy, our brother. So I want to begin by just hitting some of the points that are on your handout, and I'm going to try to leave you a little time to jot down some notes. You know, honestly, you could do an entire class on introduction to any of these epistles and, and and have time well spent, but since we've got one quarter to cover Colossians and Philippians, we're going to hit some of these things without necessarily digging into some of the the what-ifs, the possibilities, and all that. The text says it was written by Paul. That's how he begins his epistle. Paul, 
an apostle of Jesus Christ. Well, we're going to accept that. Historically, that's the best evidence. Colossae is mentioned in verse 2. A couple of different spellings. You get the point. Colossae. Uh, th this is a, a city on the Lycus River Valley, 12 miles east of Laodicea. Recognize that congregation, I would hope. And 15 miles um, southeast of Heropolis. Let me just kind of give you a little bit of a picture. Colossae was a pretty prosperous city about 100 years before Paul. By the time Paul writes, and I haven't told you when yet, it's going to whet your appetite here a little bit, but by the time Paul writes, this city's kind of on a decline. Because as you'll notice, you may not be able to see this, I hope that you can, but Laodicea and Oropolis are right there close to one another. Those red lines are major routes, major Roman roads through Asia Minor. Well, as you'll notice... Laodicea is at a junction between two northern, uh, two black lines, north and south routes, and a big old red line. See that? Well, guys, just like it happens today, what happens when you don't see that? Come on, okay? I'm colorblind and I can see it. So what happens today when major roads are built? Big cities end up where major roads intersect, don't they? Okay? What well, happened in the ancient world, too? especially Roman roads, because Roman roads carried not just enterprise, but Roman roads carried all, or also carried all of the exports of the empire. And imports also carried the soldiers when they're making movements across the empire. So big roads means big cities. So the roads and the advancements of the roads, that little black dot, again, probably can't see it, that's okay, the little black dot is Colossae. It's just off of some of these roads, which means when these roads start getting built, Colossae, kind of like a lot of small towns in Texas in the last 70 years, declines. Okay, So Colossae is not near as big and nice and prosperous a city as it once was. That's not to say that it was a nothing. Let me just kind of show you these. I think this is really good to do, even though we do not have any account or any record of Paul ever going to the city of Colossae. I just kind of want you to see what's going on here. So you might not be able to see this, that's okay. Colossae is the black dot right beside whatever color Laodicea's dot is. What color is that, honey? Not even going to tell me, are you? Because you're so ashamed. Okay. Well, that's what happens when you marry a colorblind man. So Laodicea is the southeasternmost uh, gold, green, um, yellow, thank you, babe, yellow dot. So Colossae's just right there beside it. This is the second missionary journey. You may remember the first missionary journey. Paul covers that South Galatian area, okay? Derby, Lystra, Iconium, Antioch, and Pisidia. Everybody kind of remember that? We covered it in the book of Acts when we studied that um, last year. So that was the first journey. This is the second journey. So the little red line that goes all through South Galatia goes up into northern Asia, then across to Macedonia, south to Achaia, back across to, to Ephesus, and then down to Caesarea Maritima. That's the second journey. He does not stop in Colossae. Hope you notice that. The third journey, and this may be a, a touch speculative, and this is the reason I think this is helpful. We have no account of him ever stopping in Colossae. But there is a possibility that he stopped there. We don't have the, I mean, we don't have, Luke never in the book of Acts details or chronicles. Okay, Paul stopped in at Heropolis on Monday afternoon at 3 o'clock. And when he left there, I mean, we don't have details like that. There are sections of Acts where Luke is very detailed, but even in the most detailed sections, he doesn't tell us things like that. But Colossae is right there near a trade route that would have taken him right alongside there through Laodicea instead of that random little red line that this picture has through uh, the middle of Asia. But again, we just don't know. Nothing's ever said. We've got we've to just kind of work on the basis that he never went there. That's what we've got to kind of assume because the biblical text never says he went there. Uh, I just kind of want to show you this. I think this is kind of helpful too. Um, I'm almost positive those are yellow dots um, because I'm pretty sure I, I clicked the word yellow, not the color, um, when I chose those. But that's basically the, spread, the spread of the Roman Empire. 
And up in the top left, you see the yellow dot beside Rome. There's the capital city of the empire. And over here on the bottom, kind of the center of the screen to the right, that's approximately where Colossae is. This kind of gives you a little bit of perspective. Because, I haven't said it yet, but Paul is in Rome when he writes this. That's where he's writing this letter to. A congregation, we have no biblical record of him ever having been there, and it's halfway across the known world, on the, on the eastern, almost the easternmost part of the Roman Empire. Roman Empire doesn't go much further to the east. It goes on around the, the, the Mediterranean, obviously over into modern Israel, um, into ancient Judea. But guys, it doesn't go much further than that. All right? And back to the west, it would go up into Great Britain, all the way across into Spain. Okay? So this kind of gives you a little bit of a geographical stamp. Never, ever, ever get to where you read these books divorced from the historical reality. Okay? Colossae was a real city. There are Christians that were really there. So when Paul writes to these Christians, he's writing to actual living, breathing people who are trying to be faithful to King Jesus in an incredibly oppressive and difficult world. Very similar to the world in which we live. The date, right there around the same time Ephesians was written. At the end, the tail end of his first Roman imprisonment, approximately 61 to 63 A.D., the reason we place it kind of in that ballpark is because that's about the most logical time. You get much later than that, there's got to be a second imprisonment in there somewhere, and then there's an execution around 66 or 67. So it's, it's almost got to be early 60s, 61, 62, 63, and sold. All right. That's okay. It's a Wednesday night. It's the first class of the quarter. I'll save some of my jokes for when everybody wakes up a little bit. I want you to notice some of the purposes behind this epistle. Every epistle, for the most part, is an occasional epistle, meaning it is written for a particular occasion, addressing an issue. Very few of them don't do that. Colossians is, is, is writing for a particular reason. While I say that, I want to be clear about something. None of them clearly state what it is every time. I mean, you don't read Colossians chapter 1, verse 1, Paul, a bondservant of Jesus Christ, Timothy the brother, to the church in Colossae to address these issues. He never does that, okay? But when you read the epistle, it becomes very obvious what we're talking about. We're addressing a particular issue. So, no specific claim mentioned, but clearly encourages the audience to avoid false doctrine. I'm going to give you this, though. This is a specific type of false doctrine. Um, we could discuss this in a lot of other circles. We're not going to spend time to discuss, discuss it here. But this is where the phrase, the Colossian heresy, comes in. A lot of debate about what all that, was actually, what all that actually meant, what all that entailed. I'm going to just encourage you, stick to the book. Stick to the book. Really fun to speculate about all sorts of stuff. But that's all it is. Speculative. Okay? Stick to the book and what the book reveals. You guys know that I love to talk about this stuff. Oh, by the way, did everybody get those? Hold on. Okay, did everybody get that? Everybody good? Okay. All right, so, so I'm going to just kind of offer a few of these. Um, because the last thing I want to do is leave a topic, and you get out there talking to somebody who's not a believer, and they totally blindside you with arguments against, uh, against the Bible. Okay, uh, one of my old tried and true illustrations is I don't want you to ever be in a situation where somebody goes, why is the gospel of Thomas not in your New Testament? I don't ever want you to be in a situation where you go, I've never even heard of that. Okay, if you haven't heard of the gospel of Thomas, you've listened to me for three years, shame on you. Okay, because I have talked about it several times. Um, so if you have never heard of it before, that's your fault. So just like I've done with several of the other epistles, I want to mention a couple of these. There are a lot of scholars in the last 150 years that do not believe Paul wrote the book of Colossians. Okay? So there's, there's, there's a, the general statement from that mindset is this was a student of Paul writing under his name. Now, we would call that plagiarism today. We would call that um, 
uh, dishonest and things like that today. But in the ancient culture, that wasn't the way they viewed that. Generally, they viewed that as a sign of respect or admiration, okay? So not a, oh, he's being dishonest and he's trying to persuade people. No, that's not how they viewed it. I say that just so you're aware of it. That is a pretty prevalent uh, uh, viewpoint among modern scholars, but not conservative scholars, okay? There's still a lot of good evidence to believe that Paul wrote this epistle, um, I, I, think the, I think that is what the evidence reveals. Paul wrote this epistle. But I just, basically from the Enlightenment movement to modern uh, textual criticism, there's a lot of these sorts of things that they begin to challenge and question because of that influence, okay? I mean, that, to me, that's kind of telling. Like, go back before 1850, nearly... Nobody questioned Paul, write, uh, Paul whether Paul wrote Colossians or not. But then, you know, bring in some of the modern, postmodernism, enlightenment era, and then all of a sudden, the popular thing to do among scholars was go, oh, what well, Paul didn't actually write it. Okay? So just recognize some of the historical uh, elements of that discussion. Um, so maybe a student of Paul wrote it. The other viewpoint is a collection of students of Paul wrote it. Sometimes it'll be, it'll be called the, the Pauline school of thought wrote this epistle. Again, I don't think the evidence supports that, but I don't want you to ever be unaware of it. Uh, the date and provenance, obviously if Paul didn't write this epistle, then the date would be much later. So that sometimes is a caveat to also challenge the date of the epistle well, if Paul didn't write it, then it was written in the very tail end of the first century, maybe even the early second century, but again, the evidence doesn't support that. Okay, You go back and look at the way this, this epistle was mentioned in early Christian writing, the evidence is pretty strong for an early date, 61, 62, 63, sold, and a Pauline authorship, okay, or Pauline authorship. Provenance, where it was written from, um, Every now and then somebody will say, well, maybe it was written while he was in his Caesarean imprisonment, which is recorded in Acts, but that's probably too early. Um, there also are just some pretty good indicators that Ephesians and Colossians and Philippians and Philemon were written together and sent together because of how many names are mentioned in all four of those epistles. We sometimes call them the prison epistles. Names that are mentioned in all four epistles Pretty good indicator they were written around the same time, maybe even sent around the same time. And a good indicator of all of that is when Paul says in Philippians, the imperial guard, he's talking about the household of Caesar. Um, pretty good indicators, just biblically speaking. Paul wrote this from Rome, not Caesarea, and also not an Ephesian imprisonment. Uh, occasionally... Somebody will say what we're reading here is an issue with an early Gnosticism, which is that, that, the viewpoint of the secret knowledge. Does everybody kind of realize that like, when you get into John's epistles, that's what he's addressing a lot of, is the different uh, sects of Christianity that believed Jesus gave secret knowledge to certain people and deprived other people of knowledge, and that's part of what John is addressing, some of those viewpoints. If you've never read up on Gnosticism... Uh, it's absolutely psychotic. Um, different gods, they don't necessarily believe in the one true and living God. They believe in the God uh, who created all things, and they, they believe in the Demiurge, which is the serpent, basically, in Genesis 3. And these, uh, it gets really weird and muddy. Um, and some people believe that Ephes or Colossians, look at that, almost dropped the Ephesians word, uh, some, some people believe Colossians is written addressing some of that, but man, guys, how much better off would we be if we just looked at the text and said what the text is saying and then really, really carefully determined my viewpoint should align with this text, okay? Let's not go off, let's not go off base beyond that, all right? We'll just always be better off if we'll go back to the text. I do think John's epistles are addressing some of that. I think Colossians is a little too early for some of that. Okay, and you're welcome to, to your wrong opinion um, if you'd like it that. All right, one, one other thing I want to mention. Uh, some of the key features. 
Some of these kind of are, are, go without saying, but I don't want to, I just, I just can't stand to not mention them at least a little bit. The relation to Ephesians, that, that really can't be undervalued. There are statements in Ephesians that are made that you kind of scratch your head over. But if you'll go read Colossians as the companion epistle, it fleshes it out. So let me give you this one. Some of this is an issue because of the way the modern culture reads it. But like Ephesians 5, uh, 19, be filled with the Spirit. Or Ephesians 5, 18 and 19. Be filled with the Spirit. Um, speak to one another in psalms, hymns, and spiritual songs. And what, Man, what are we talking about? Almost sounds mystical. That's because of modern charismatic influences. But then you go read Colossians 3.16, and he says, be filled by the Word of God. Same context of the discussion. He uses the exact same terminology, but switches a particular word or two to make it say the Word of God. Well, that's what he's talking about in, in Ephesians 5. So you can actually look at one to help explain the other a little bit. Okay, um, That is really, really important. So just don't miss that. Uh, Ephesians is sometimes the more elaborate, more lofty language but Colossians and Ephesians mirror each other. Big time, big time, big time. Very high Christology, okay, which is the study of Christ. Lots of stuff in Colossians where I said uh, Ephesians and Colossians are really written around, you know, lots of the same stuff, but Paul will make more expressive comments that just really should expand our viewpoints of Jesus. Let me just kind of give you one Look down at verse 15. Chapter 1, verse 15. He is the image of the invisible God, the firstborn over all creation. Verse 16, for by him all things were created that are in heaven and on our earth, visible and invisible, whether thrones or dominions, principalities or powers. All things were created by him and for him. He is before all things and in him all things hold together. He is the head of the body, the church, who is the beginning, the firstborn from the dead, that in all things he may have the preeminence. Now I want you to appreciate, folks, he does not say that in Ephesians. But what does it reveal? A supremely high view of Jesus Christ. Okay? You go read John 1, you go read Hebrews 1, go read Genesis 1, you're going to get kind of some of the same stuff. And what Paul's saying is, Jesus was the creative force behind Genesis 1. Okay? We'll, we'll, we'll get into that when we need to in a little bit. There's a lot of attention given to the Jewish issues, mysticism and philosophy. Um, you're going to see some of that language pop up in chapter 2. It is worth noting, and it does kind of explain a few things. There's a lot of discussion about cosmology and power. You guys that were in the Ephesians class last quarter, what did we notice? Ephesians was very concerned about the concept of power, weren't they? Because in Ephesians, you had a lot of the mystical arts, the, Di uh, the, the temple of Artemis, Diana, all of the mysticism that went with that. Well, you got some of that same stuff going on in, in Colossians, but a little different twist on it. It's worth noting. But like Ephesians, you've got a very high view of the church, and you've got a lot of emphasis given to holy living. The basic outline. Paul likes to format things. He doesn't do this in every epistle. So, okay, don't take this as a general statement applied to everything. But Paul likes, because of this, do that. Okay, so he'll section the first part of a, of a whole body of material because of this, do that. Ephesians is a great example of that. Colossians does it to a lesser degree. Chapters 1 and 2, the significance of Christ. Chapters 3 and 4, our, our service for Christ. All right, I hate to skip over this, but we're going to have to skip over the... No, I think, okay, we'll make it work, we'll make it work. Everybody have that? You have uh, any of that you didn't get? Um, you, you can see me after class. I'm not going to open it up for questions right now because we still have eight verses to cover. Okay? Uh, so let's get into the text. Colossians 1, verse 1. Paul, an apostle of Jesus Christ by the will of God, and Timothy, our brother, to the saints and faithful brethren in Christ who are in Colossae, Grace to you and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. We give thanks to the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, praying always for you, since we heard of your faith in Christ Jesus and of your love for all the saints, because of the hope which is laid up for you in heaven, of which you heard before in the word of the truth of the gospel, 
which has come to you as it is also in all the world, and is bringing forth fruit as also among you since the day you heard and knew the grace of God in truth. As you also learn from Epaphras, our dear, our dear fellow servant, who is a faithful minister of Christ on your behalf, who also declared to us your love in the Spirit. All right, I want to work off of that text. I guess we'll go ahead and ask these five questions here. Who is with Paul at the time of writing? Timothy, question number two. What two things had Paul heard of them? Their faithfulness and their love. What does that suggest about their reputation? Had a good one. Yeah, pretty much it, yeah. They had a good one. I want to say some stuff on that again. You know, we did that with Ephesians, but I'm, I'm going to mention some of that again in just a minute. Number three, why are they described like that in verse 4? There it is. Verse 5 gives it away, doesn't it? Because of the hope. Question number four. What had come to them, went into the world, and was bringing forth fruit? Say it again. Hope of heaven and salvation. The gospel. I like how we can say the same thing, use different phrases. That's what we're talking about, isn't it? The gospel. The gospel. The hope of salvation. Hope of deliverance. Very good. All right, question number five. Explain minister of Christ on your behalf. Break it down a little bit. What's the idea of a minister? And if you say a professional preacher, okay. A teacher, teacher, okay. What's another word? Really important word. What's another word? Messenger, okay. What is it? Evangelist? Okay. I want us to think more generically. Quit thinking preacher. Servant. There you go, JP. Servant. Guys, we need to be really careful about this. Sometimes we develop a clergy laity view, okay? Um, well, that's the preacher. That's a preacher. That's a preacher's job. Guys, we need to, we need to really back off of some of that stuff, okay? Um, is it true those terms are used in Scripture? Absolutely they are used in Scripture. Evangelist, minister, those things are used in Scripture. But at the same time, guys, there's a very real sense in which that is to describe every disciple of King Jesus, okay? Um, so we need to be really careful not to get to think in an official capacity of some kind, okay? Um, so he is a servant of Christ on their behalf. Notice what he does. He is bringing the message. He brought it to them initially, but he's bringing more message, more message to them, more of a message to them, okay? All right, we're going to work through that in just a second. Let's work through this text a little bit. We're not going to kind of work through it as deeply as we have some other stuff because we're going to try to save a little time, draw some applications. Verse 1, Paul, an apostle of Jesus Christ by the will of God. Paul starts a lot of epistles like this, doesn't he? When he makes a statement like this, guys, what he's doing is expressing his authority. He has the right to say things like this because he is an apostle, okay? He is a messenger for Jesus Christ. And I want you to kind of notice, when he says an apostle of Jesus Christ, that, that little two-letter word expresses a lot of big things. One of them is it expresses ownership. Paul is an apostle who belongs to Jesus Christ. Okay? Kind of maybe see some flavors we should be thinking about for ourselves. We all belong to Jesus Christ. Okay? Paul says that right in the opening few verses here, the opening few words here. He belongs to Jesus Christ. He is a delegate on a mission for the Lord. And here it is, by the will of God. Paul expresses something like that in a lot of places, doesn't he? You remember some of the challenges that Paul faced were people saying, Oh, Paul, you're not a real apostle. What does Paul do on a lot of occasions? He defends his apostleship. If anybody's an apostle, I'm an apostle. 
Okay? He does that on a number of occasions because there were those going around preaching things against him. Maybe in the back of my mind, I'm just going to kind of think of Philippians chapter 1 because we're going to talk about that in a month and a half or so. That's some of the same stuff there. So Paul, really, when he, when he gets an opportunity, he's going to just tuck this in. He's not an apostle because he wants to be. He's not an apostle. Allow me that for a second. He's not an apostle because some man has put him there. He is an apostle because he has devoted his life to King Jesus, to do King Jesus' will. He is where he is by the will of God. And then he tucks in Timothy. He says, our brother. Remember, Paul and Timothy were not actually brothers. But because of their bond in Jesus Christ, he could relay a familial term like this that expresses some degree of intimacy, of bond. I look at you. We do not share the same mother and father. And yet, I call you my sibling in the faith. Brother and sister in Christ, notice that, in Christ, because we are bound to our Father, our true Father, and Jesus Christ, our elder brother. Okay, He's going to hit on that again in just a second. Look at verse 2. To the saints and faithful brethren. Uh, the word saint, what's, a, what's another way we would think about that? What does that mean, to be a saint? Does it mean you've been ratified by the church? No. Now, what is the idea being expressed? If I were to say the word sanctified. Set apart, okay. Well, maybe, uh, do you have a footnote in your Bible that says literally? The idea is holy ones. That's what saint means. Holy ones. If you, you, know, if, if you don't have a Bible in your home that has some good footnotes that say some stuff like this, I would advise you to invest in one. Because a lot of good Bibles will say literally the term means holy ones. Remember that terminology, guys, because what was old Israel supposed to be? They were supposed to be the holy ones. They were supposed to be God's holy people. That's where we get all of those statements about holiness in the New Testament because they're rooted in the Old Testament. They're rooted in Scripture. Uh, when Peter says to be holy as he is holy, he's quoting Leviticus 11, 44 and 45. When God calls them at Sinai, this is part of, the, part of the requirements of following Him in Exodus 19 and 20. You're going to be like me. If you're going to keep following me and be my special people, special people, then you're going to be a holy people, okay? Set apart for His purposes. The idea that was expressed in the Old Testament is brought to reality in His new covenant people, His New Testament people. What Israel failed to do, his new covenant people fulfill through Jesus Christ. And I want you to notice that, guys. Look at verse 2 again. To the holy ones, to the saints, he says, and faithful brethren. No such thing as unfaithful, okay? You're in or you're out. I know we like that little gray area, but you're either fully committed to King Jesus or you're not, all right? So again, he says, brethren denotes familiarity, denotes uh, commonality. We share our Father. We share each other. But then I want you to see this. In Christ. See that? To the saints and to the faithful, brethren, in Christ. He mentions that before he mentions Colossae. In Christ who are in Colossae. I want you to just kind of think about that for a second. We talk about that a lot in Ephesians because that's one of the biggest themes in Ephesians. In Christ. In fact, if you remember the handout, the handout said... In parentheses, we were going to talk about Ephesians for the third quarter at Northwest in 2023, and right below that it said, in Christ, in parentheses. Because that's what Ephesians is about. Being in a relationship with Christ puts you in a relationship with other believers, and it is about a relationship, all right? That's kind of what he's talking about here. The spiritual relationship that they share with Christ is what binds them together, and it supersedes their relationship with geography. So they may be in Colossae, but even more importantly, they're in Christ. You see that? Just kind of, just kind of observe that. It's not as big of a theme in, in Colossians, but it is still part of the Colossian discussion. Okay, We're in Christ, means we're in the family of God, means we are to be the holy ones, means we are to be faithful, means we are brethren. We need to be committed to who we are, committed to whose we are. Okay? 
Look at verse, uh, the last half of verse 2. Grace to you, peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. Same kind of introduction he does every time. Um, you know, we don't always appreciate some of the political overtones of statements like this. You, you may recall the political charge of the early 60s in the, in the Roman Empire. The father of the nation was Caesar. Remember us talking about that with Ephesians class last quarter? The Lord to the Roman Empire was Nero. But when Paul writes his epistle, he does not draw a little section in the middle where it's like, you know, you can kind of swear your allegiance to both. No, he comes out pretty clear. Guns are blazing, man. I don't know if you ever saw the old uh, uh, Yosemite Sam. You know, he whoops out both pistols, just goes to firing. That's Paul, man. Paul is a rootin' tootin' uh, gospel preacher. I don't think anybody has ever put those words together. But you're welcome. He says, God is our Father... And the Lord Jesus Christ. It is not Caesar. It is not Nero. We serve a higher power. Okay? All right. Verses 3 through 8, we're going to have to just kind of hit some highlights here. So he thanks God, mentions the, as, as the Father again, mentions the Lord Jesus Christ again. Okay? We, he says, I th- we thank God for you. We pray, we're praying always for you. Some of the same stuff he mentions in all the epistles, and I, and I made this point with Ephesians, but man, it impresses me. How did Paul get anything done? You know, I, I recognize he didn't have Twittergram on his iPhone that distracted him from focusing on some spiritual things. Um, but guys, all of these people he's praying for all the time, these are people he, he's never met in the biblical record. Okay, Monja, we're going to stick to the book here. In the biblical account, we have no record of Paul ever being in Colossae. But he says, I'm praying for you always. What did he do with his time? Well, I'm going to tell you, he prayed a lot. Look at verse 4. Since we heard of your faith in Christ Jesus and of your love for all the saints, I want, I want you to just kind of think about that. Paul had never met this congregation, but Paul knew who they were. Paul had heard about them. Two components there. Their faith in Christ Jesus, which which kind of reminds us of their loyalty to Christ. If we're talking about loyalty to the empire, loyalty to to Father Caesar, loyalty to Lord Nero, no, sir. Paul says, I've heard about your loyalty, and it ain't no Nero, it is King Jesus. That impressed Paul. That same conviction should impress us, too. But notice, it's not just about their devotion to King Jesus, it's their devotion to each other and your love for all the brethren. Paul likes that. You know why Paul likes that? Because he saw it exemplified in Jesus Christ, and he was acting it out himself. Why is he praying for these brethren? Because he loves them. Okay? Committed to the family. Look at verse 5. Man, I just lots of stuff I'd love to say here. By the word, he, he mentions the word saints again. So for all the holy ones at the end of verse 4. Look at verse 5. Here's here's part of why their reputation precedes them, because of the hope which is laid up for you in heaven. I want you to notice now, we're talking about being in Christ. Now we're talking about the heavenly realm. These are people in Colossae, and yet their hope is in heaven. You see that? It'd be just like people writing to the Northwest Church in Beaumont, to you folks in Beaumont, whose hope is really in heaven. Man, that ought to describe us, guys. That's part of why Paul's so impressed by them. He says, you've heard before the word of the truth of the gospel, verse 6, which has come to you as it has in all the world. The gospel was going places, places Paul had never even been. Probably this is a reference back to Acts 19, the two years Paul spent in the school of Tyrannus, um, where he was preaching the gospel and the word was going out through all of Asia. Okay, Acts 19, verse 10. That's probably where the church in Colossae began, and that's probably some of the references here. Part of where they've heard the gospel is verse 7, Epaphras. Epaphras was mentioned in the Ephesian letter. He'll be mentioned again a couple of other times. He's a faithful servant, a fellow servant, faithful minister, and uh, boy, lots we could say there, but mm, we're just not going to get to it. Uh, Be an Epaphras. Okay, that's, I want to say that. I'm going to say it, okay. Be an Epaphras. Faithful minister, that's servant, fellow servant. That's the way Paul viewed this man because that's the way this man lived. Lots of people, guys, we share the pew with, but we don't actually share convictions with. 
Okay? So we need to find, we need to find our people. We need to encourage our people. All right, I'm going to throw these to you real quick. And uh, I'm just going to hit a couple of the high ones here because I know that was the second bell. God's people are called holy ones. We need to see ourselves as a continuation of the Old Testament story. We are to be holy ones today, okay? No room for unholiness. Uh, we need to be holy. Number two, we need to pray even for brethren we don't know. Um, we, we do a good job of that here, by the way, for the most part. You know, we have a big old hurricane hit Florida somewhere, and we're praying for folks we never even met. Well, we need to keep doing things like that, guys, because that's part of the biblical account. Number three... Just ponder this. Do you have a reputation for faith and love? I know we're talking about a congregation here, but congregations are composed of individuals. All right? Does that describe you? And if it doesn't, man, that's something we need to work on, guys. Um, I'll tell you right now, you, you, you know, if you're a member of a congregation, you always appreciate this. If you're a gospel preacher visiting other congregations, you pick up on this immediately. Did you leave an impression with Warren Berkeley? You know, he was just here over Saturday and Sunday. Did he, did he look around this auditorium and he immediately gravitate to some people because he knew they're here, they're committed, they're convicted, they're focused, they're encouraging, um, they're living by faith and in love? I mean, guys, that's something we need to really give some thought to. Uh, the gospel, number four, bore fruit then and still can now. Went throughout all the world. He's writing to people who were exposed to it, believed it, convicted by it, and were living under it, Okay. And I want you to just think about this. The gospel is learned. Just, hmm, man, love to talk about that a lot. Verse 7, you learned it from Epaphras. Guys, the gospel is learned. What does that mean then? It means somebody's got to teach it. Okay? And it's not left to just the Pauls and Epaphrases. It's tough to say Epaphrases, by the way. But that's up to everybody. Okay? That's up to everybody. All right, looking forward to this quarter. We got Colossians and Philippians lined up. I appreciate your attention. Didn't give you a lot of time to talk tonight. I'll make up for it. Um, never, probably. But, uh, but I'll try to leave a little more room for interaction on Sunday. So I appreciate your attention tonight.